All right, hi, my name is Ben Engber. I'm the founder of the company called Thumbtack Technology. Uh, we are a consulting company with one of our primary uh, practice areas being in uh, doing NoSQL development and advising clients on NoSQL. And the background of this talk is, you know, one of the things that comes up really often when we talk to clients, one of the first things they ask us is, uh, what SQL database, what NoSQL database should we use? Um, and then, you know, the follow-up is, well, we need to learn a little bit about your business, so let's do some discovery, and that's, it's the correct answer, but it, it often doesn't go over that well. And so what we wanted to do is we want to have, a, you know, sort of at least a, a basic uh, baseline that we can introduce them to some of the main concepts um, to give them right off the bat and then sort of introduce a deeper discussion based on that. So about six months ago, we started a research wing within our company to do some uh, NoSQL evaluations and research on the subject. And this presentation is sort of um, presents a way that we can compare across these products. So in some ways, what I'm going to do is come in and argue with everything that Will just said about why you can't build an abstraction layer. <laughs> but really, <laughs> Love it. It's, uh, <laughs> no, it's actually a good compliment here because, um, you know, of course these products are different and you've got to be pretty careful in, in what you're going to do and comparing them is pretty difficult. So um, all the use cases he described are the use cases people have and this is going to, I'm going to walk through our experiences in trying to do this abstraction layer and sort of a solution around that. So I, I think it'll go fairly well. All right. So as I said, um, we get uh, interest all the time in NoSQL databases. And people coming to us range from clients that have heard the hot buzzword NoSQL and have decided to use it but haven't decided what to do. Um, often that's a very bad idea. To very technical companies who um, actually maybe have already implemented various types of NoSQL solutions but are bumping into performance problems or data modeling problems or, and so forth. Some of the problems that people have is that a lot of the published literature out there and so forth comparing these is kind of riddled with different kinds of problems. A lot of the benchmark studies, which is often the first place people go, are sort of quick and dirty things where people just sort of do default installs of databases, run some queries against them, and make conclusions they really can't make. Um, there's a lot of bad reports out there. Um, and then others sort of delve into somewhat obscure things like the cap theorem. Does, does, do people here know what the cap theorem is? So, all right, so about half. Uh, cap theorem is actually very simple to describe. It essentially says um, the C is for data consistency, the A is for data availability, is your system up, and P is partition tolerance, which essentially means can you handle network failures. Um, the cap theorem basically says you can choose two of those. Um, so it's easy to describe and also, I would argue, mostly misses the point when people talk about this. It misses the point because if you're implementing one of these systems, you have a network and your network will fail, so you've got to be partition tolerant. And consistency and availability probably doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. And trying to compare things on, on, on these dimensions just leads to more confusion. Um, so what we want to do is sort of take some of these theoretical discussions and turn it into business cases and try and answer some, some use cases and some business use cases in technical terms for people. Um, so why use NoSQL at all? I actually think um, most people come up with a version of what Will talked about. You, you need to handle a large number of transactions, you need to handle a lot of data, data and uh, you don't want to deal with crazy problems and tremendous manual overhead when systems go down and you need to recover and so forth. Uh, last bullet that a lot of people come with is you want rapid application development and having schemaless storage is useful in that way, but it's not really something that's easily quantifiable, so I'm going to focus on the first three bullets. So, we had this great plan of how we have this new research wing. We are going to do a whole bunch of stuff. The first thing we're going to do is be really, really simple. We're just going to take a big bunch of databases. We're just going to do a very simple key value storage test. We'll use the Yahoo cloud serving benchmark, which is 
as much of a standard as you can kind of get for this, although that itself is riddled with problems. Um, and just take some of the existing studies out there and apply it to a, a new use case that hadn't really been studied too much. That is, we're still doing key value storage, but let's measure it against bare metal and solid, solid state drives. And because that is pretty much what people who are handling really high volumes are going to need to have to buy it anyway. And then once we have that, we're going to release a series of other reports. We're going to study secondary indices. We're going to bring in all kinds of other databases. We're going to measure data loss. And this was just going to be a nice quick beginning just to, to do that. And uh, boy, were we wrong on that. Um, this, this was much, much harder to do than we thought. Um, it's hard to do not only because these databases are different in terms of how do you size your data set and the row sizes and the configuration parameters, but fundamentally they work in very different ways. They have, we talked about CAP and, and we'll go into it, but, but fundamentally they take very different steps to achieve these different kinds of things and it's very hard to compare them on equal terms. So what we quickly found was, it's, was the first question we had to cover was, how do we even make a fair comparison of these databases? So we, first thing we do is we drastically reduce the number of databases we were going to cover. We brought it down to, as I said, Aerospike, MongoDB, Couchbase, and Cassandra. We chose those because those were the four that clients most often came to us. Uh, Aerospike's probably less known than some of the rest, but in ad tech, which is where we're, we have a strong presence, it's very well known, plus they have a database specifically geared towards SSDs, so it was an obvious choice. Uh, use the standard client, and, um, wait, I think I went backwards here. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to, why am I going backwards? All right, time for a keyboard. All right. All right, so fundamentally, um, once we get these baselines in place, we will just do some basic performance measurements on them, and then after that, we're going to look into what it means when they encounter hardware failures. All right. The first thing we did was break these performance baselines into two different scenarios. We called them fast and reliable. Um, fast essentially meant we're going to, we're going to configure these databases to serve as much traffic as they can without regard to your ability to lose data, to, to retain data. Uh, that means principle, asynchronous replication, asynchronous writes to disks, keep all your data in RAM on the nodes. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean not consistent, and we'll talk about why in a, middle, in a minute. Another thing to mention here is that um, when we say fast, it doesn't mean it's not reliable data. The data still gets written to disk, you know. It still gets replicated to other nodes. It just doesn't do it synchronously. And reliable is simply the converse. We're just going to take the data, make sure it gets to SSD, and not consider any writes valid until it's written to disk and, and replicated. To describe how to do this, we sort of need to go into how these databases function. As I mentioned, these databases are wildly different from one another. So please bear with me. There's, there's going to be four pictures here of what goes on. Um, Couchbase, in, in many ways, is the easiest to describe. Um, it's essentially memcached with replication and, and persistence. And you basically, this is, this is a hypothetical cluster of, of six nodes. There's data on various shards spread across it. In each one of these, we're assuming a replication factor of three here. So each node is a master for one shard, and there are two slaves for each shard. And Couchbase is a consistent database, but it, it achieves this very simply. It just always reads and writes from the master. Um, the fast scenario, very easy to describe, it reads and writes to a master and returns immediately, doesn't wait for the data to replicate. You have the option of asking Couchbase to wait until that data is replicated now you have consistency. 
MongoDB works very much the same way, but it uses a more traditional MySQL master-slave replication model. Um, but essentially, you either wait for the writes to succeed and get propagated, or you don't. Cassandra is where it gets a little more interesting. There's no way you're going to be able to interpret this, so bear with me. Um, but I want to talk about it, because this really starts to illustrate why this notion of available and consistent starts getting really confused. All right? Cassandra, in the fast case, you have a single client that's going to read to a node or write from a node, but which node you're reading to is completely independent. So if you write to a node, eventually it's going to make it to some of the other nodes in the cluster. And if you read from a node, that node is eventually going to get the data you want. But as you can imagine, that is truly inconsistent data. Cassandra enforces consistency in actually a, a simple way. Right? You can, when you write, you can either wait for one or all or a quorum of the nodes to acknowledge the write. And the same with you when you read. So if you read data, if the number of nodes you read from plus the number of nodes you write from is more than your replication factor, <coughs> you're going to get consistent data. So that might mean you write to all the nodes every time and read from anyone might mean you write to one, but you always read from all of them and just take the most recent. Or you write to two, and you read from two, and you take the most recent. That's all built into Cassandra. The, the complexity here is, if you look at the, what Cassandra says on, the, on its wiki, it says, in a distributed data systems like Cassandra, consistency usually means that once a writer has written, all the readers have seen that write. That's true. That's true. That, that model absolutely enforces that. But if you think about a case like one node writing to all the other nodes, um, and you have people reading just one node, while that write is in progress, some, some reads are reading the new data, some reads are reading the old data. And sure, when the write is done, they'll all get the new data. But it's probably not consistency like most people think of consistency, and certainly not consistency like people moving from relational databases think of consistency. Um, for our test, we used um, the write, write, uh, write all, read one model of consistency for our test, because it is, it is durable, for sure. Um, but it's something to keep aware, to keep in mind when you're trying to design Can your database. Sure. So that means that when you write one, you basically all the subsequent writes to slaves and compete for writers compete. So let's say on one of the nodes, you know, a rate cache battery dies, right? And it becomes slow. That means that the whole, you know, set of nodes that connect to it also slow down. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's a really good question. So that's and not we're going to get into this in some, in some real detail here. So it kind of defeats the redundancy in a way. It doesn't, it doesn't defeat, the, defeat the redundancy, but it does cause a dramatic effect yeah. on trying to do consistent rights. And so I, I will actually get into that um, in, in a bit. Okay. Um, one question, I don't feel the question. Um, what is the uh, node count? At? Is the node count relevant in these pictures that you've uh, been drawing? The node count? Yeah, this is just assuming a six-node um, six system with a replication factor of three. Okay. Just drawing it because I mean, is that similar to all the other pictures? I just want to make sure that I understand. Yeah, all these pictures that I'm showing yeah. are what you do if you had a six nodes in replication factor of three. Okay. In fact, our test was four nodes in replication factor of two. Got it. Because we're poor. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> this, this actually illustrates a little bit more, so I, I was a little That's generous in the picture. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, Aerospike, uh, again, simpler to describe. It works just like Cassandra when, when running in fast mode. Um, for its writes, uh, for, the, for the reliable mode, it actually has acid semantics. So it does distributed transaction commits in all the nodes and behaves in an acid way. All right. Um, this is a big grid, which um, I'm not going to go into now because in the interest of time, but this presentation is available online and you can look at it if you want. Um, what I want to talk about is consistency on single node failure. That's kind of the interesting thing we're talking about here when we talk fast or reliable. 
If one node goes down, have you lost data? When we're running in synchronous mode, no. When you're running in fast mode, yes. All right, so that being said, those were the baselines we set up. Um, the tests are actually very simple. We put the databases on the cluster, we tuned the crap out of them and made sure everything was optimized for the appropriate hardware according to the vendor recommendations. All these guys are our partners, so they all helped us you know, make sure everything was tuned and, and yielded us a lot when we made mistakes. Um, and then we just we load the data set to, to a disk, just do regular inserts, determine the maximum uh, throughput we can get either with a sort of a balanced read-write workload or a 95% read, 5% write workload. And then do that again and measure latency for various levels of traffic and then repeat the whole thing for the in-memory, the fast case. All right, so talking about inserts, it's not the most important part of this. What you can see is the key value stores were in fact extremely fast, uh, both Couchbase and Aerospike hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, the SSD scenario here, I, I made sort of a funny bar, and that just sort of, just want to illustrate why it's so hard to compare these. Uh, the issue in this case is Couchbase needs a lot more RAM, a lot more metadata in RAM for each row. So there was just no way to compare and search performance back and forth. Um, we had only 200 million rows of data for Couchbase for 500 million rows of data for Aerospike. So yes, it loaded it quickly. It's not directly comparable, and there's no way to balance everything out. What we wanted to do is get the right balance of disk to RAM, so it meant different data set sizes. A more interesting chart is this. All right, again, this is, um, for both workloads, you can see the number of transactions we get against the system. Uh, when running in fast mode, these things were very fast in D, ranging from like 450 to 900,000, with Cassandra and Pongo trailing drastically. But not all that slow with 100,000 for Mongo. Um, when running in our reliable mode, probably the most obvious thing to note here is, uh, well, two obvious things. One, Aerospike was an order of magnitude better than anybody else. And Couchbase didn't run at all. Uh, <laughs> Couchbase, in theory, you know, I, the underlying disk it was doing about 40,000 operations per second, but it got bottlenecked by RAM. So this is something we've been going back and forth with Couchbase on. And they hope to release a fix, you know, one of the minor versions coming up. But right now, don't try and use Couchbase in a, in a synchronous way is, is the, the main takeaway. Um, I have a lot of these graphs. I'm only showing you a couple. The main thing to see here is, uh, much like what uh, Will and Mike said, um, we saw you know less than one millisecond latencies all the way up to top capacity on both Aerospike and Couchbase. And even for you know Mongo and Cassandra, for most of their throughput levels, they were very fast and trailed off only when they were reaching their absolute peaks. So these, these systems were all quite fast. Uh, sorry, I just want to uh, confirm. So you're saying that the peaks of many of these are, I mean, they're kind of way towards the left side of the graph. I'm trying to understand that. So Well, yeah, good question. Let me repeat the question, please. Oh, right. So the question was, why are the peaks all the way to the left side of the graph? And the answer is, if you actually, if you go back, because the maximum load that Cassandra and Mongo is getting is way less than the maximum load that the others are getting. So what you see sort of all the way on the left with Cassandra is actually Cassandra maxing out at about 30,000 operations. And that's but still having a decent throughput, but at a very low, kind of a fairly low uh, response time. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. And what was the limitation on that? Was Sorry, where is the question? Was it always memory that was the limitation? I mean, Usually what happens is there's usually an exponential climb, uh, similar to kind of maybe the uh, Cassandra on the RAM asynchronous. So usually when something maxes out at, uh, say, x 30,000 a second, right, all of a sudden I'll see an exponential climb when it goes to 35,000, almost drops off, is unmeasurable. Yeah, so on, on, the, on the synchronous, the, the, um, it was definitely just bound. 
So I'm sorry, the question was, what was the limitation? What, what limited these things and caused these latency slowdowns? Um, in, in, for the synchronous case, it was disk IOPS. For the asynchronous case, um, you know, it's actually, the, the, the one thing I said, I'm, 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 it's a little hard to tell right here. They seem to be sort of page swaps, but it wasn't necessarily that easy to know what was going okay. on. Sure. Um, I got lost somewhere. When you're talking about synchronous, what are you what are you referring to here? Are you talking about wait, you know waiting for the uh, the write to, to complete? Is that what you mean by synchronous? Yeah. In other words, the next write won't occur until the first one completes. What do you right, mean? Right, right. So the question is, what do I mean by synchronous here? And I should probably have described use consistent terminology for my for my slides because I, I find the fast and reliable use cases. This just means the reliable use case. That means we will wait for the replica. In this case, our replication factor was two, so there's one replica. We will wait for that replica to be to, to confirm that it's been written to before the marking the write is okay. And if possible, we will confirm that the disk has been written. Okay, now confirming that the disk has been written is um, not the whole story because the the disk, the disk could be written, but the, the F-sync might not have run yet. So it might actually be still in sort of controller memory. And that differs from database to database. Um, but the, the replica, uh, the replicate into the other replica is the critical point. Because if you lose the node, you still have the data. Question, uh, aren't these like oranges and apples in the sense that Cassandra's model is eventual consistency, whereas MongoDB and Cars TV, they would work differently uh, in terms of making RAM and give you that. So when we're looking at this, I mean, uh, we could, you know, if you wanted to, you could tune it to serve a particular purpose. So just want to understand, how were this done? I mean, were these for a ad related place? Because SSD will crash in certain situations where I have terabytes, so it's just not going to work. So what was the, uh, I'm sorry, I did find it earlier in the presentation. What was the focus of the study? Like what was looking consistency across the board? I mean, off the cap tier, what was CAP or were these tests just? Okay, I'll try and paraphrase your question. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, these scenarios, um, are they, when you say consistency, are you really trying to match consistency to consistency? Um, are you trying to map the same consistency levels for databases? And, and the answer is sort of. The problem with the term consistency is that it means different things right. fundamentally. So, you know, Couchbase is always consistent because right. it always writes to the master. However, if that master node goes down, you've lost data. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you're not screwed, and that's a perfectly, there's lots of good uses for that scenario. You know, as a persistent cache, it's fine. Sure. Um, the, um, so we're not actually measuring that. We're trying to measure how much do you care about data loss. So what these two scenarios are, are um, the asynchronous represents Cassandra running in inconsistent mode. Correct. Okay. The synchronous represents, and all the other databases as well, Synchronous represents um, waiting for that replica, for another replica to be populated. In Cassandra, that means using write all in our test. So it is running Cassandra's consistent so you're mode. Forcing it. I think you answered my question. Yep. So you're forcing it to be consistent and then measuring it. We, we're, we are, right, we actually hacked the YCSB code to have a consistent mode, because that's not I something supporting our box. All right, so I think the, the conclusions for the performance part are, are obvious. Aerospike claims to be an SSD optimized database. They've written their own drivers to access the raw hardware. That was very clearly true in our tests, so, uh, so that's why they like us. Um, for the uh, asynchronous way, both uh, Aerospike and Couchbase were, were just unbelievably fast, and the other databases really were, were pretty fast too. Um, this doesn't really 
this only answers sort of half the questions, right? That's the raw performance. The next question is, is sort of, what does this really mean in the face of node failures? We know you lose data, but what actually happens? So that's what we tried to answer next. So we then sort of created a set of tests to disrupt the cluster by taking a node down. Um, you know, this, this picture down here was our hypothesis. It was what we expected to happen. Um, a node goes down, we expect the cluster to be unavailable as it tries to figure out what the hell happened, comes back up, eventually gets to its original throughput, and then the same thing happens when you bring a node back up and it tries to recover from it. And then there's a period of replication, and then you're done. So we did this, we modified a whole bunch of parameters, throughput, different ways of killing the nodes, the same um, scenarios we've talked about before. And I'm gonna walk you through some pictures quickly that I think illustrate better than numbers do. All right? This first set of pictures uh, describes what happens when you run at 75% load in our fast case. We chose 75% load because if you're taking one node out of your four node cluster, you shouldn't expect to be, you should expect to be do, able to do up to 75%. So a perfect system will show no impact, um, and an imperfect system will show stuff. Um, what you can see here is that in the fast mode, these all basically work sort of similarly to how they did before. Um, you know, Cassandra had some latency penalties while that node was down, Arrow Spike showed very little other than a very brief period of downtime. And the others sort of came in between. There's a little bit, you can see in Couchbase, there's a little bit of replication uh, traffic at the end because Couchbase erases its node when you rejoin it to the cluster. I'm uh, sorry, could you, could you just tell me the graphs? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a, the question is, what do these graphs mean because they're tiny? <laughs> um, so the, the horizontal axis is time. And the vertical axis is throughput in operations per second. Okay, so the top one is operations per second, the bottom right. one is throughput. So the top one is operations per second, the bottom one is latency. Not latency. So, um, and they're highly correlated. And all, are all yeah. the graphs on the same scale? They are not on the same scale. Uh, the, the, the numbers are from the, the last one. So you can imagine aerospikes is, we had 300,000 before, yeah, it's 300,000. And that's actually, that's a good point, which we'll talk about later. Sometimes you'll see a big dip in one of these graphs. That doesn't mean it's slower than the others. It just means it's slower than it was. It's probably more important to see the dip because you're going to be using this for capacity planning. But don't compare them in absolute terms. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just sort of to illustrate what happened here, the next thing we did was we ran it at 100% capacity, which as you might expect, when a node goes down, you've lost 25% uh, you've lost of your capacity. And, and you can see that all the databases, except Mongo, which just uses traditional master-slave, um, show that behavior. And you could see some of the impact of getting up to speed a, a little bit more than some of these other ones. Both, both Couchbase and Aerospike you know, have to work a bit to get up to that prior level because they're trying to replicate against essentially their maximum capacity. Um, to me this is, I mean it sort of illustrates why we're doing 75%, but you shouldn't be running your hardware at 100% capacity. So probably more interestingly is the 75% version for reliable. Okay? You can see we have a, a question mark shaped couch for couch base because we just couldn't get it to run. Um, but this, this goes, uh, I think, to Mike's question. In the case of Aerospike, um, when you bring down a node and you're required that you replicate on each request, Aerospike does what you would hope it, something would do and replicates to a new node. It finds a new place to store the second copy of this data. So it's able to continue processing transactions throughout the whole period. When you bring that node back up, well, you've just been doing hundreds of thousands of writes per second for 10 minutes. You've got a lot of database uh, operations to replicate. So there's a very severe penalty that lasts for some time as it tries to bring the node back up and replicate and, and bring it, the new node up to date. Cassandra and MongoDB, sort of, this is the central question of what we asked. 
if you're running with only two copies of data and you're saying write to both of them, Cassandra and MongoDB do not relocate that data. Those writes will simply fail. So they simply have downtime. And um, you know, the good news is when they get back up, there was no data to replicate, so it comes right back up. And the, it does for Cassandra too, that's an artifact of a driver, which is not a particularly interesting story. Um, but, but I think the central lesson here is, if you want uh, consistent data, have at least three copies for these databases. And don't use write all, because you're gonna, get, you're gonna see this. In terms of uh, total downtime, you know, it's, it was a, bit, a little bit chaotic. The, the, there seemed to be no pattern as we rerun the tests. But the good news is all of these databases didn't stay down very long. All right? uh, on, when we brought a node down, the worst thing we saw was about 12 seconds of downtime. Uh, Couchbase, there's a little special thing. They, they take about 45 seconds, but if you write your own monitoring and recovery scripts, which we did, you can get it down very low. And on bringing a node up, only Mongo had any penalty really whatsoever, um, about 30 seconds. Again, this doesn't mean you're at full capacity, this just means how long is your, cl your cluster down. But our reaction on this was, you know, if you're talking about six seconds of downtime, you probably got other problems bigger than your, your database. So, so from a downtime perspective, these all seem to work as advertised. Another big chart here. Um, again, if you're if you're interested, please download it. If you have questions, you, I'm happy to go back to it. But the potential data loss here is sort of the discussion. We sort of calculated some of the data loss out, um, assuming the parameters, assuming the results of our test. So I can understand. Uh, no, uh, can you go back? Sure. I just want to make sure I understand. One. Um, it was a uh, no down replication. Is this the like, that mean? That oh, so the um, right. So what is what is what does that percentage mean? No down replication is the the percentage of data that is um, fifty percent means you have one and a half copies of your data, right? Which is exactly what you'd expect if you took down one of four nodes. And so, uh, Cassandra, why does it say NA there? Because Cassandra doesn't really accurately report that number. Um, you know, it, it reports the number of, um, of um, what do you call it, S -t I forget the name, SSTs, I forget, I forget the name of what it has, which it doesn't necessarily clear, so it's a little hard to get sometimes. Um, and then when it comes back, it went up to a, 100, with the exception of Couchbase, which was up to 76, because it, it takes some time to recover, basically. And, and measuring the time to recover, by the way, um, you know, when a node comes up, Couchbase wipes out that node and re-replicates everything. So it's always sort of showing you the worst case replication number. Um, one thing we considered doing was trying to measure how long does it take to achieve sort of full capacity again. Um, the problem is that's not a very interesting number because if Mongo's doing 20,000 writes per second and you know, Couchbase is doing 500,000 writes per second, Couchbase is a much bigger problem to solve, so how do you even compare these numbers? Um, sort of what you need to know is that's going to be there. You better plan for it. Yeah. Uh, one more question about this. I guess the potential data loss column, or row, I guess there's only two, only Aerospace Sync and Cassandra Sync are the ones that have none. All the rest are susceptible to data loss. Yeah, in, well, in if you mode, run so Couchbase in synchronous mode and it works, that would also be none. Okay. And MongoDB in synchronous mode would also be none. Um, those are not typical running modes for those two databases. And this table would be completely unreadable if I included those two in there. Okay. So if it's, if it's running synchronously, that answer is none. So essentially, in typical usage scenarios, Aerospace and Cassandra should be your target for, for targeting data reliability. Is that essentially what, what I should MongoDB be like can do it too. MongoDB can do it too. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think about it. So, the, so the, let me repeat the question because I didn't repeat the question. Uh, the question is, sh should Aerospike and Cassandra be your databases of choice if you're targeting reliability? Um, 
of these four, those two are designed explicitly for that case. So that is a natural setting for them. Couchbase claims it is a setting we were not able to get it to work. MongoDB can have that setting. We were able to get it to work. Um, for these results, we found Cassandra and Aerospike more compelling. Uh, we found them more compelling because their numbers were higher for this case. Uh, MongoDB is more of a document database. We're doing a raw key value store. So we, we highlighted certain things. There's a lot of data behind these tests. Mongo's not a crazy choice. I'm wondering uh, how much of this is really being influenced by the limited number of servers you're using. Uh, how, how much of, so the question, how, like if you had 10 or 20 servers, would you be experiencing these same latencies, you know, for recovery, uh, especially if you have, you know, lots of redundancy and re replication going on already to prevent, you know, failures? Right, I, I will, I actually, this probably is a good, the question is, how much of this behavior is an artifact of our cluster size? Um, which is a good segue into the, into the next slide, okay? Or just two slides from now. Um, you know, the, fir the first thing I would say addressing this is, right, is, what does it say about MongoDB and Cassandra um, if you have a replication factor of two? Well, it doesn't work if you want to do reliable. Um, if you have a replication factor of three, it says it won't work if you're using a write all semantics. But if you're using quorum semantics, um, it should work. I would have loved to have given sort of pictures of what's going on in that case, and that is a, you know, it's going to be have to chopped up as a, as a to-do. Um, the issue there is just very simply, what we were running was bare metal hardware with an array of SSDs. It's actually pretty expensive to put even a four-node cluster together for this. Um, there is a sort of an analog test, which we're actually doing right now. Let's just put, put these on EC2, take a whole bunch of nodes. You're not going to get sort of those Aerospike SSD numbers because there's, there's latency in all the virtualization and so forth. Um, but you can get a sort of a, a better picture of how larger cluster sizes handle failure. That being said, um, some of these effects are effects of the amount of data, right? If, if you have hundreds of millions of rows that need to be replicated, those hundreds of millions of rows need to be replicated. And that's going, and they need to be replicated to every node that's picking it up. So obviously if you have dozens of copies of this data and one node down, it's probably not gonna affect you nearly as much. I'm not aware of too many people who have, you know, a lot more than three copies of data floating around. Personally, I'm not really aware of people doing that because your hardware investment goes through the roof. So for, um, for the reliable scenario, could, you, could I, I guess, assume that for similar data reliability, I could use a replication factor of two for Aerospike to get similar reliability to MongoDB and Cassandra? Is that yes. it? Yes. Okay. More or less, yes. Okay. Now, I mean, with, with certain caveats, if you use two, and you lose both those nodes, right. you're still going to lose some data, whereas if you use three in MongoDB and Cassandra, you'll still have a copy. So three is probably a good idea just across the board. Like, and five is even better, right? I mean, you, you have a balance <laughs> of how many copies do you want versus how much <coughs> do you want to invest and how, how much do you want to deal with a large cluster. Okay. Um, the odds of you know, both nodes going down in discatastrophic ways not, not very likely, um, especially because you can bring another node up and, and start recovering immediately, but it's a possibility. The odds of three going down is getting pretty remote. Um, these products do have cross data center replication, right? So your data center getting nuked or something could be an issue right there. If you want to get to that highest level of reliability, um, you know, cross data center replication becomes, is something to consider, but that, sort of opens a, a whole new can of worms because you start to be limited by the speed of light of getting your data to the other data center. So 
you're definitely not getting one millisecond response times if you're trying to write to multiple data centers synchronously. So these all, I mean, all these databases allow you to tune how you do cross data center replication on that. That also was well beyond the scope of our lab. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Sorry, did you have a question, Tom? So, I mean, the asynchronous case is sort of the eventually consistent one, right? Um, and, and it would seem in that case that having greater than two is good because they think you get voting, right? When, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, if, if, there, if a no goes down, or if you, have, if you have enough, then you can vote on which, which if pulling the data back, if it's coming back from multiple, multiple nodes, you can have a voting thing which determines what the data should be. Well, that's the that Cassandra form. So the question right, is, right. In, in an eventually consistent system, um, is the replication factor of three good because you're allowed to vote on which copy of the data is best? And I like talking about Cassandra because Cassandra works in a very simple way that makes these questions easy to illustrate. So the quorum mode of Cassandra is if you're reading from two copies of the node when you have three, you pick whichever one has a newer timestamp. Because um, if it was written to, to two there, you read these two, the one that with the older one must be the wrong one. That's not exactly eventually consistent. That's fully consistent. Um, because you've written to two copies and you're always getting the latest data. Uh, the eventually consistent um, is the first case where you write to one. Even if you read from two, neither one of them might have the data yet. So it's not, it's not, so the fast scenario is not, is still not, is still eventually consistent, and the reliable scenario is fully consistent. Um, and again, the consistent, the consistency ends up sort of being the wrong thing because, um, you know, MongoDB and Couchbase will always return a consistent answer unless something goes down. Um, in which case they won't. Um, well, I'm starting to repeat myself here. I think it's, I think it's obvious. Yes. In Cassandra, can you select how many nodes either you're reading from or writing to on a call by call basis? So the question is, in Cassandra, can you do the can you choose the number of nodes being re read to or written from on a call by call basis? The answer is yes. That is true for Cassandra, for MongoDB, and for Couchbase. Uh, for Aerospike, it is a server configuration parameter. Uh, after having your initial uh, load of data, are you actually having this test player that actually only the reads data, or there is even a read and write at the same time too? Is there a player that actually reads and writes, or only reads? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, after having the initial write of the initial test data, uh, are these latencies for the only the reads, or are there even the writes going on? Okay, that's a great because question. Because the reason I'm asking is, the last time I checked, there is a certain read to write ratio MongoDB suggests. Otherwise, it gives a high latencies. So some database have a certain read to write ratio that they suggest. And maybe there, in my case, in my situation, I found Aerospec to be really good irrespective of whatever the read or write ratio is. So the, the question is, um, are, are there read and writes occurring on these databases concurrently, and what is the ratio of reads to writes? Um, so, and, and the latencies report, we report, are they read latencies or write latencies? The answer is we ran several scenarios here. Um, the ones we're focusing on here consist of two different scenarios. One is a, a concurrent blend of 95% reads and 5% writes. Um, that's sort of just sort of a read heavy, very common application scenario. The other one is a 50-50 mix of reads and writes. And so when I show balanced workload and read heavy workload, that's what those two columns are. What are the latencies we're reporting on that? Um, the answer is um, we have a lot of those graphs. And in the interest of time and boringness, I've only included a, a, a very small number on this report. If you're interested in exactly which reads, which read latency and write latency for each scenario, um, we have the full report. It's a long report that has all of these, and so you can examine them to your heart's content. Um, I actually don't remember which ones I included here, whether those were read latencies or write latencies. 
Um, I think I included some read, like just one scenario with just reads and writes top and bottom. Um, um, I'm curious why you covered two versions of Couchbase. The question is why did we cover two versions of Couchbase? And the answer was we were doing Couchbase 1.8 and then we, turned, we learned that this study was a lot harder than we thought it was going to be, and they released Couchbase 2.0. So we did both. But did you compare your experience with one after? They performed really similarly, actually. But 2.0 had cross-data replication. That was not the same as first generation. Right. So the, the point is that Couchbase 2.0 has cross-data center replication capabilities. That's true, but since we didn't have multiple data centers, it not, was not one of our test suites. Uh, Couch, Couchbase 2.0 also has secondary indexes and a bunch of other features. Um, Couchbase 2.0 also completely rewrote their storage engine, which made us think that it would have a dramatic impact on performance, especially in the synchronous case, and we, we saw no real significant difference there. Not, neither one really worked. Um, now, again, this was when you test 2.0.0, um, none of these products were bug free. I'll put it that way. Cassandra was probably the, the, the least buggy. Um, but all of them had issues that cropped up that as you sort of structured certain kinds of tests. But in all the cases except that one, we were able to work through the issues with the relevant vendors. Yes? Uh, is, is the presentation that Talk about big data. I'm thinking tera and terabytes. Yeah. That to the gentleman that asked earlier, these tests are in SSDs. I would, I cannot do that. So in NoSQL, I'm thinking tera terabytes because if I have to get my IO will kill me from that perspective. So did you do HBase uh, or uh, in the BIM paper that's on the website? Do you have HBase also? Because that would be a true comparison in my opinion. All right, so I think there were two questions there. Uh, one question is, did we do HBase in our tests? The other one is, uh, is, is something... SSDs, because if I look at the configuration yeah. of this error sheet, it's pretty small. I mean, it's just a few gigabytes. Uh, it is, yes, you, you, we used... Is, the second question is, gee, you used probably half a terabyte of SSD capacity, is what, right. is what we yeah. use. Um, so the first question of, did we do HBase? Um, no, this was part of our original grand plan before we decided to simplify down. As a company, we do use HBase. As a company, we're actually in process of trying to quantify it along these same dimensions. HBase itself, you know, is built on top of uh, the Hadoop file system, which leads to all kinds of performance issues. And there are companies like MapR Technologies trying to put it on top of a, of a different file system to get some better performance out of it. These are all things we're, we're actually working for in our next report. So the short answer is, is no for HBase, but we have some sort of anecdotal evidence that you're not going to see numbers like that. Um, the SSD size, um, again, I'm going to have to plead poverty. Um, half a terabyte of SSDs is expensive, but terabytes and terabytes of SSDs is even more expensive. And so um, we chose, we, we put in 500 million rows relatively small rows for two reasons. One, to get a lot of rows in without completely soaking, I mean, that, while fitting in those SSDs. And two, um, network bandwidth. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, it's pretty easy to saturate your, your network and not learn anything interesting. Great. Uh, just, I mean, just by the way, suggestion-wise, the whole DB would be a perfect The question is, did we look at VoltDB uh, for this test? Uh, the answer is, um, we certainly looked at VoltDB. Um, using VoltDB as a key value store didn't seem like a prime use case for VoltDB. Um, using VoltDB you know, in sort of a more sophisticated comparison based on secondary index queries versus right. SQL is an interesting statement. VoltDB, for those who don't know, is a distributed uh, new SQL database that allows you to run much of you know, ANSI SQL and, and run SQL queries 
across a cluster if you relax a few things. It just wasn't the best fit for the for this okay. piece. Uh, yeah. Can I ask something? So you mentioned the cost of SSDs. When was the last time you looked at the cost of SSDs? <laughs> uh, because uh, the whole, I mean, I'm thinking more from the perspective of cloud. So this is a true G2E or any application server model where you're sending the data. But if I got ter terabytes, uh, exabytes of data. Uh, With I'm exabytes, you probably cannot do SSDs. Right. With Good amount of terabytes you can do SSDs very cost effectively. You would be surprised. Right. I'm just thinking of the like, industry of capturing everything and uh -huh. anything, and I want to reduce market research, market driven research for ads. I just was thinking of that point. Well, I, I would think of it this way. Right? So if you have a large amount of data and you need answers extremely quickly, right. you really kind of have two choices. You either use rotational drives and put enough stuff in RAM, put like as much of your working set in RAM as possible that you're rarely hitting those drives, or you put it on SSDs. If that's not your use case, and you just have tons of data and latency isn't the problem, that's not the question we're trying to answer here. Okay, okay that's right, thanks. Yeah. yeah, this is for you know, people who need a second you know, consistent response to high school general. Uh, this is not the case of analytics over you know, petabyte of data. So I realize you didn't do this on EC2, but how hard would it be to set these systems up with SSDs on EC2? Uh, the question is, how hard is it to set these systems up with SSDs on EC2? Um, the answer is, it's not hard to set them up. And EC2 has high I.O. instances that you can you know, play with. Um, EC2 has other properties that make some of these things complicated to analyze. So just because it's virtualized, there's sort of unpredictable latencies and, and so forth. Um, we are doing sort of an EC2 follow-up, but you know, when you're studying low latency performance, EC2 is not a natural place to start because it's got unpredictable latency. So believe me, it would have made our lives a lot easier if we could have done EC2 for this test. Um, but in practice, I think most of us are going to be using C2 for many of us. Anyway. Right, well, I, I will say um, larger cluster sizes, we don't, you know, is on our radar. We're working on that right now, and we're using EC2 for that. Um, but I don't have meaningful results for you yet. Um, so you spoke earlier about having to do a lot of configuration, which is often source of problem in comparing these uh, different systems. Um, how would you recommend like, an engineer to go around doing that if you didn't have access to a partner or direct access to? Well, the, so the question is, given that we did a lot of configuration and given that we talked trash about earlier studies, I'm paraphrasing, um, how, would you, how do you actually uh, configure these systems? Um, this is one of the reasons why we put this together. So we go into extreme detail on the papers themselves of how we set these systems up. So that's a good place to start. Um, the vendors themselves will help you. You know, Aerospike, if you're installing Aerospike and you talk to Aerospike and say, how do I get better performance using this kind of hardware? They're gonna come in and they're gonna help you because this is their bread and butter. Um, for something like Cassandra, Datastax has a ton of free documentation on their site, what parameters to relax in their experience for EC2, and so forth. And so, um, something like Couchbase has a lot of information on how to size your cluster and so forth. So it's there, just, it takes some work. It takes some work, so I hope that the papers we, we release gives you a head start to get in there. Similar question um, in terms of amount of time it took to learn and to get operational with each of these four stacks. Um, probably a good thing you didn't throw HBase in there, otherwise it would have been crazy. <laughs> but what uh, was there any any learnings there? Um, the question was: Were there learnings on the amount of time it takes it to get to learn these databases well? From our perspective, that was the biggest learning curve. We were 
and they said wildly optimistic. We're like, we'll be done in a month. I'm going to put a couple engineers on it. And it took us like three and a half months to get that first paper out. Because, um, and that was dramatically reducing the number of, number of databases. So the big learnings are, gee, trying to get fair answers is really hard. Um, luckily, you probably won't have that exact problem. You don't care if it's fair. You just want to learn your individual database. So that's going to be, you know, divide by four at least. Um, the other learning from our side is be prepared to throw out the majority of your data, um, which is painful, but you got to do it. So, so we did it. We learned. I mean, we, we gathered a lot of data, understood why that data was wrong, and then moved on from it, and it's not here. So you mean the sense of many iterative tests that, yeah, that, were, right. that were failed or inconsistent for, for one reason or the other? A lot of things like, gee, that looks kind of funny. Why would that be the case? That doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Let's investigate on a deeper level what's going on here in terms of replication. Oh, that's probably not what you want to do under high load. Let's, let's try messing with this a bit. Oh, that makes more sense. There's a lot of that going on. Question. Um, I guess, do you have any um, any experience, like cursory or otherwise, with I guess some of the relational databases are trying to like kind of bridge the gap, like something like Postgres is like adding native JSON support and internal JavaScript support, and the the, the benchmarks seem to be fairly close with at least some of them. And do you do you see that as like kind of a I don't know, like if you if you don't have that much hardware and you want to like kind of consolidate and pick one. Does it make sense, like performance-wise, to use a relational database for the, in that type of use case, or is that so is that not a good is that not a good use case? The question is, does it make sense to use a relational database for this kind of use case? Um, well, that's the question, right? And so um, the answer is, it's it, it's not it's certainly not crazy. And in fact, before NoSQL was a thing. That's exactly what we did. You know, kind of come in and and their SQL databases were sort of collapsing and they're joining everywhere. And we just worked with the application and denormalized and started storing things in key value-like ways. And it made it much, much easier to shard the data to multiple servers. Um, you can use replication to go across. And, uh, and in fact, you know, this is what you know what you know Twitter does, for example. I, if you've looked into something like Gizzard and FlockDB, have you looked into that at all? Okay. So what these are, uh, these are, you know, Twitter basically wants to maintain a graph, all right? And it's, so it's who's following whom um, just writes essentially single key value records into lots and lots of MySQL and then has a layer to distribute the load and balance that load. It's a totally reasonable thing to do. Um, I would argue that this is a lot easier to do um, because these have all these features built in. We did not have to write something like Gizzard to get these clusters to come up and down when we messed with the node. Okay. And when you do something like that with a relational database, um, you need to be you need to frame our operations fairly carefully. So, as an example, you know. Twitter has a fairly simple use case. They have one directional um, you know, relationships between people. Facebook, also using MySQL, um, has bi-directional relationships. You friend someone, they're your friend back. That means every write needs to go to two different places, and those might be inconsistent. They have to handle that eventual consistency themselves. So they have repair processes running trying to find consistent data and get them back into sync. That's that's a lot to deal with. Um, so, at least you see other. If you were to do that, even if it's stupid, uh, is there like some more performance between the two? Or it's 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 not stupid. <laughs> it's not stupid. The question is, is there similar performance if you do that? We do do that as well. Um, but I'd say manual sharding. The issue is, I mean, you're not getting performance. We have not gotten performance anything like hundreds of thousands of operations per second doing that. Um, we have gotten performance of you know more like ten thousand, okay. um, 
Those systems have been in production, they work fine, but they're a pain to manage. So, for instance, we have an application which, again, it's like a, it's affiliated with Facebook and we're maintaining your social graph. Um, we have to hit the shards in the right way. Each shard is using standard master-slave replication somewhere else. Now we want to change the schema somehow. Do we break replication, update it one place, update it the other, reestablish replication? It's a lot of maintenance. The advantage is it's a very, very well understood technology. So um, you're, you're not going to hit that tippy top level of scale. It might be enough scale for what you want to do. But I would seriously consider the cost of maintaining such an infrastructure. Okay, thank you. And the question was, uh, is it crazy to use a relation database in the way we use NoSQL database? So in the Will's report, we're talking about NoSQL databases and the NoSQL layer around that. The fact is, in our system, we actually use relational MySQL database is one of the components working in the same framework. Actually, that allows us to, fa uh, to start one project much faster just using uh, the experience developers had on just uh, developing uh, regular uh, uh, SQL databases. So we just use that experience, we started faster, but we're absolutely ready to switch that project to the NoSQL database. The way we're using my, MySQL now is the NoSQL way. So it's absolutely not crazy and it absolutely works. You can also set up in-memory slaves. There's, there's things you can do. You know, should you? Very rarely, but sometimes you can. Yeah, could. sometimes. So what kind of performance difference do you see between the relational and NoSQL? Oh, it's, it's pretty good. We're not talking here about uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, but it's sufficient for the task. Right, so it's uh, uh, thousands of transactions a second, it's pretty good. But the table structure is very simple. It's uh, key value storage, pretty much the same type we use in, in SQL databases. Okay. SQL database is one huge advantage. You can actually see what's going on there. <laughs> so uh, that's what Mike said. It's, it's a good start, like you just to develop your application against it and you know verify the data is you know, you read, you read and the right makes sense, uh, and then swap it yeah, for higher performance. tools to, yeah, yeah. to see the data, right? Just and then you can swap it for, you know, for a higher performance engine. Can I ask a question? So, um, just going about the SQL and non-SQL thing, one of the things I was recently looking for, and I can't think of the name right now, but it was developed by the company Stripe that makes online payments, and they created a project that takes MySQL's tail logs and replicates it to Postgres so that they have their backend database and they can do all the analysis and all that and they use MongoDB, sorry, MongoDB as a front end for our data and then they keep replicating it real time to Postgres so that they have um, the backend data. So, so it's, I mean, it's a good combination of both. Essentially what you're saying is there's a company um, that produces something that can take <laughs> Uh, MongoDB replication logs or, or MySQL replica uh, replication logs and replicate uh, to Postgres or other databases. Um, that's what's traditionally called polyglot persistence. Um, you know, what, what, what we can talk about some of the disadvantages of NoSQL to begin with, or, or maybe the advantages of SQL databases, which is SQL databases are very, very good at running sort of arbitrary queries joining against things and so forth. These are, are facilities that you give up when you move to NoSQL. It's, it's what you trade to get some of the scalability. So, you know, most organizations can't live without that in the end. So when we're, when we're talking about these kinds of things, you know, if we're talking about hundreds of thousands of transactions on the front end, you're not doing that in a SQL database and, and you're certainly not joining. Um, the, um, but you do want to analyze that data. So at some point, you know, most everyone I know is taking that data off that, bringing it into some kind of analytical storage, either a SQL database or a data warehouse of some kind, and analyzing the data there. It's, it's extremely common. It, most people I know have had just sort of homegrown solutions to, to pull out and write in but I'm sure there are a ton of products that do it as well.
So um, probably the best way of doing that that we found, because we looked at this extensively, is you need to have this huge data set available, very, very you know, highly available, and it's very high throughput, low latency, and at the same time in the you know, analytical storage, is um, you stream this data into a log as you write it uh, to the NoSQL engine, and then this log is being fed, you know, through so, you know, real-time processing systems like Kafka, for example, into your data warehouse, and then you just stream your data into parallel things. Uh, otherwise, you have to extract a snapshot, you save it, it takes a long time, by the time you're done, it's already changed, so it's very, very painful. Um, so, the plug. Uh, in a month, we're gonna be hosting a, uh, a Vertica meetup here in this office, which is a, uh, you know, a, a very high performance, uh, very fast SQL database, uh, you know, data warehouse type analytical database. So we actually use both engines for this type of stuff. Is that what you use primarily? Well, you said SQL, do you use MySQL and Vertica or just Vertica and then Vertica? Uh, MySQL and Vertica. Okay. Right. Vertica is good for lead operations, right? And you can't really do transactional stuff there. So anything where you have to have transactional license consistency, you use MySQL. Have you looked at Adopt? Uh, yes, we, yeah. we have not in the Hadoop ecosystem. No, Adopt. It's off. It's off for that. Yeah, it's yeah. quite. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that has an H in, in its name. I'm going to resume the presentation, but I, I suspect that the next slide is asking for question. Not quite. Um, but this is probably stuff we talked about. Finite wealth was a serious problem in a lot of the tests. Um, we recognize that, but it's a problem we have. Um, the other thing is, we, when we created these failures, we tried to create them in a lot of different ways. We did network split brain, we killed processes brutally, we killed them nicely. Didn't learn too much interesting, um, these applications tended to work unless you did really bizarre things like one-way network failures. But uh, it's a lab, it's not the real world. I'm sure you're gonna find ways to break this. We just didn't find it. And I, you know, I mentioned a bit some of the issues with trying to tra track replication delays and so forth. Um, again, I think my questions addressed a lot of this. We do need to evaluate larger clusters. We're doing that on EC2. Uh, the results won't be directly comparable because we don't have the same latency, but at least we can do larger clusters. Um, and then moving beyond the key value store is another whole can of worms which we have to find the right baselines for. But we're researching it. And if you guys, sure. So have you um, ex ex no. met anybody who used an EC2 as sort of a disaster recovery kind of? Um, environment and then would accept you know a lower performance but you know consistent performance somewhat if they had to bring it up so that's not the main production but uh, you know as a, as get a, get it to a point where it still works you, know, you don't get five milliseconds you get you know 15 milliseconds but it doesn't die on you so the, the question is do we know someone who's using uh, EC2 as sort of a, a hot spare production I don't but I know, I mean, for instance, Netflix runs their whole infrastructure off Cassandra, off Cassandra on EC2. Um, well, you can definitely do that. The question is, uh, I mean, Netflix doesn't have to you know, do these types of use cases. It's a different use case. I, I don't know anybody who does that. Sounds reasonable. I don't know anyone who does that. Um, so if, if, if there is a specific database, I heard HBase, which we're already looking at, but just, you know, let me know and we'll, we'll try to get it in. And so lastly, again, uh, you know, with Thumbtack, this is what we do. If you want the, the presentation, you can 
download a slightly outdated, I'll update it soon version right there. The papers are available at the other link. Um, they're long, but they have really a lot of detail in them. Um, if you want to contact me, um, there's, there seems to be only one Ben Engber on the internet, um, and, and my, my handle is Ben for pretty much everything. So, any last questions? Did you look at the ER? No. Um, I am personally very interested in REOC. It, it is um, it's an interesting technology. It's, it's something that almost never comes up in our conversations. So it sort of got deprioritized. I kind of pushed for REOC to be included in this study, and it, it just didn't make sense because we just never hear interest in it. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. One more question. <laughs> Um, have you heard anything about some of these more real-time aggregating tools like Google's Dremel or um, MetaMarket's Druid, Druid, um, more real-time, quote-unquote real-time data stores? The question is, uh, do I know much about real-time data stores like Google's Dremel or I already forgot the second one? Because the answer is no. This is not, you're just leaving my area of expertise. I don't know. Too much about it. I know. I know companies who are doing real-time analytics on top of Mongo. Actually, Chartbeat does that. And a number. A number of companies do that. Not super familiar with the technologies we're talking about.